Hi, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first of the CITP Tuesday lunch seminars. Um, this, is one, this seminar series is one of the many exciting things that CITP has planned for the coming year. Um, this project that I'm going to talk to you about today is joint research with Ian Lundberg, Alex Kindle, Sarah McClanahan. Ian and Alex are graduate students in the sociology department. Sarah is a professor in the sociology department. And this project also involved hundreds of researchers from around the world, including perhaps some of you in this room. I see you, Malta. Is there anyone else that participated in the Fragile Families Challenge? Malta, Malta did. So thank you, Malta. Thank you to everyone else who participated. Um, so this talk is particularly exciting for me um, because this is the first real thing I'm doing in my role as the interim director of CITP. Um, so just by way of background, I'm a sociology professor here. I've been at Princeton since 2007. And I remember with fondness that one of the first things that happened when I got to campus was Ed invited me, Ed Felton, the previous director, invited me to come and give a talk at a CITP seminar. Um, and so I got to talk about my research. And that was a great introduction into the exciting community that I think is CITP, bridging ideas from computer science, social science, and public policy, and now increasingly from philosophy and the humanities. So it's a wonderful community, and I'm very happy to be able to participate in the community in this new way. So um, I think one of the best kind of intellectual introductions to the way I think about the world is this book, Bit by Bit, Social Research in the Digital Age, which I just published. And the way I think about it is it's for social scientists that want to do more data science, data scientists that want to do more social science, and anyone interested in the hybrid of these two fields. So I spend time in each of these communities. I'm trained as a sociologist. I work in a sociology department. But also during sabbaticals from Princeton, I try to spend as much time with data scientists as possible. So I did a sabbatical at Microsoft Research. I did a sabbatical at Cornell Tech, the new Cornell campus in New York. And then just recently, I did a sabbatical at the New York Times, where I worked a lot with the data science team on the business side. And so I spend a lot of time in each of these communities. And I think they really have a lot to learn from each other and a lot to contribute to each other. So it's kind of like when you have two friends that you know would really get along and you want to introduce them, so you have a party to get them to introduce, you know, get them to get to know each other. That's kind of how I think of this book. It's my way of trying to get these two communities to get to know each other. Um, and then the specific project I'm going to talk about today is really, I think, an illustration of the kinds of things that we can do now when we combine insights from different fields. Uh, so this project is actually really motivated by Wikipedia. So I like love Wikipedia. I think it's just amazing that a bunch of volunteers from around the world have created this great intellectual resource and made it freely available to everyone in the world. Um, one of the things that I find really fascinating about Wikipedia is that it didn't require any new knowledge to create all the knowledge that was needed already existed in the world. What was instead needed was a new way for people to collaborate. And the digital age enables new forms of collaboration. And so this may make you wonder, as scientists, what are things that we can do where all the knowledge that we need already exists, but we just need new forms of collaboration? So the idea of doing a large-scale collaboration in the sciences is, is not new. Um, so this, for example, is the paper announcing the sequencing of the Human Genome Project. This paper had hundreds of authors. This is the paper about the discovery of the Higgs boson. This paper had about 5,000 authors, scientists and engineers working together on one problem. Also, these people were from all over the world. So if hundreds of biologists can sequence a human genome and thousands of physicists can find the Higgs boson, what would happen if we had hundreds of social scientists and data scientists collaborating on a project? What could we do together that none of us could do individually? So that's what we're trying to do with this project, the Fragile Families Challenge. So now that's a little bit about the form of the project. Now let me tell you about sort of the empirical results that motivated this. 
So in sociology, a big study of research is what we call stratification, kind of like who gets ahead and who falls behind. And one way that you could summarize huge amounts of research is with this equation. Don't tell my colleagues I'm doing this. Uh, very overly simple. Um, but the basic idea is we have some kinds of outcomes, why. We often call these attainment. So these could be things like academic achievement, occupation, or income. Then we have some predictable component of that attainment. So often we model these in a linear regression. And we make statements like, uh, let's say, men earn more than women, even after we adjust for the level of education that they have. That's the kind of statement that uh, we would traditionally make about this predictable component. Then there is this unpredictable component, the error term. And that is the term that we normally don't talk about or think about. But that is actually the dominant thing. So all of our theories focus on this piece. But empirically, this piece dominates. So if you look at the measures of uh, model fit for the things that we publish, they're actually terrible. And if you saw a scatter plot of, of like what is the size of the predictable component, what is the size of the unpredictable component, it's, it's really bad. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why this unpredictable component may be dominating. And so we said, you know, what if we said, you know what's really good at predicting things is machine learning and lots of data. So, and most sociologists haven't taken this style of approach to a lot of our questions. So what if we try to get a really, really big data set and we try to use modern machine learning methods and we see how well we can predict certain outcomes? How small can we make this unpredictable component? And so this gets at really two different styles of research. So I talked about blending ideas from social science and data science. So uh, I like to think of these as the Y hat culture and the beta hat culture. And so let me explain what I mean here. So if you were to go to a talk in the sociology department, uh, a quantitative talk, it generally has a structure where someone presents a theory or some kind of, then they describe some data. Then there's uh, some version of linear regression. There's a table of coefficients of these betas. And then the talk really hinges on whether those betas are statistically significant or whether we can conclude that the beta is zero or not zero. And that's kind of the general recipe for a sociology talk. And that's kind of the general recipe that I thought all quantitative talks took until I spent the year at Microsoft Research. And I went there, and the first talk, there was a lot of theory, there was a lot of data, there was a lot of modeling, and there were no beta hats. It was all Y hats. The, all of the work was assessed in terms of predictive performance. So for example, if you were building a spam filter, you might care how well you can predict what's spam and what's not spam. You wouldn't care as much about what features are associated with spam. So now increasingly, I think we're seeing a blending of these two kinds of ideas. So there's a move now in machine learning to make more interpretable and explainable machine learning, which is trying to bring this beta hat style of work into predictive modeling. And I think increasingly what we'll see in the social sciences is a move to bring predictability into our quest for understanding. And so what I'm going to show you with the Fragile Families Challenge today is a two-step process where first we're going to do prediction, and that's going to help us do understanding. So you should think of this as Y hat. What I'm going to show you is Y hat in the service of beta hat. Okay. So before going on, though, I think when I talk to other sociologists, this is one of the most common questions I get. Why should I even care about predictability at all? As one of my <coughs> colleagues said, we are not trying to be weather forecasters. Um, so I think you should really, for those of you who are not social scientists, I think you, it, is a, like, it may be surprising to you that social scientists really don't prioritize this or even care about it very much at all. Uh, but if you're a social scientist and you're here and you're saying, why should I care about this, let me try to convince you. Uh, so the first is I think there are very important policy reasons. Uh, so this is an article from the New York Times Magazine about whether an algorithm can tell whether a kid is in danger. This is about what's happening now in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, which is basically Pittsburgh. And they're using <coughs> uh, AI or a machine learning system to try to create risk scores whenever a call comes in to the Child Protective Services hotline. So I want to emphasize that 
here I don't need to tell everyone that there are big reasons to be concerned about this. There's all kinds of problems that can go wrong about fairness in machine learning, bias in the data, and so on. I also want to emphasize there are really a lot of opportunities here. So just yesterday, I went to a talk in my department, and it was a woman who had done an ethnography of the court system in Chicago. So she could say the courts and the jail. And she described them as being really pretty bad places, uh, full of racism, full of people making decisions without sound scientific basis, and so on. So I think there are a lot of potential problems with this, but I think we should also realize there are a lot of problems in the current system. And so it's going to take some wisdom to try to figure out what are the opportunities and what are the risks. And I think as scientists, we can provide some basic scientific facts that will help policymakers who have to wrestle with decisions about how to, how to do these things. Also, I think there are really important scientific reasons to care about predictability. So one is that this is a basic social fact. So as sociologists, I like to think we want to study society. And a basic fact about society is how predictable someone's life is given what we know about has happened to them in the past and given potentially what we know about their parents. So sociologists in the past have studied a lot about how a parent's characteristics and a kid's characteristics are related. And so what are the processes through which intergenerational advantage is transmitted? It's a core, core thing that we study. But the basic social fact of how well can we predict what will happen to someone, given that we know certain things about them, is not well studied. Uh, even though that's something that varies a lot based on societies over time within the same society and so on. Also, I think the quest for improved predictability will lead to other scientific discoveries. So we'll come up with better statistical methods, we'll come up with better ways of collecting data, we'll enrich our theories, because uh, this drive for predictability can be a good way to trigger scientific thinking. Okay. So that's why we should care about predictability. And the Fragile Families Challenge is situated inside the Fragile Family and Child Wellbeing Study, which my colleague Sarah McClanahan and her colleagues have been working on for the last 20 years. So it's a birth cohort panel study, which means it starts when kids are born. And they sam randomly sampled about 5,000 children in 20 US cities. And they did an oversample of non-marital births. So births where the parents were not married. And they were particularly interested in what happens to kids and what happens to these families uh, where there are non-married parents. So that explains the name of the study. So one, these, fa these are families, even if the parents aren't married. But also, these families are fragile. Demographically, these families are least likely to remain stable over time. <laughs> and then they followed these families over time, uh, collecting data systematically at regular intervals. So this data set is enormous and well used. So it's already been used in hundreds of papers and dozens of dissertations, but all from that beta hat perspective, all from trying to understand what's happening. And we want to say, let's just take this data that you've collected for so long and just look at it in this new way. Try to take this kind of prediction approach and see what happens. So here's the way many social scientists would think about the data. So you have different data collection modules, and then there are different waves of data collection. So at the birth of the child, there was an interview with the mother and an interview with the father. And these interviews actually happened at the hospital. That was one of the main innovations of the study, was it was very difficult to find a lot of the fathers in these non-marital births. And so they realized that actually at the hospital was the best time to find them. And so the researchers went into the hospitals right at the birth. And there are these great stories from the participants in the study about, oh, I remember when I was in the hospital, they came and interviewed me. It's really great. Like They have a real relationship with the participants over this very long period of time. And then there was another interview when the child was age one, three, five, and nine. And you see that as the child gets older, they start collecting increasingly more data about the larger environment around the child. So they do an in-home assessment where they go and systematically observe what's in the household. Um, they interview the child, the teacher and child care provider, and so on. So when I got involved with the project, this was the state of the data. So the age 15 data had been collected, but it was not yet publicly available. 
And it turns out that lots of longitudinal surveys have this property, and it's a huge, huge, huge opportunity that most of them don't take advantage of. And the reason it's a huge opportunity is that if you have this collected but not publicly available data set, you can use an idea from machine learning to try to create a research design to measure predictability. And so this is the way a machine learning researcher might think about this data. So you have a bunch of families, and you have a bunch of variables or features, things about the family that have been measured. And this data from birth to year nine is available to researchers. This data from age 15 is not available. So I just want to emphasize, when you take all of the variables that have been collected over this time period, and you stitch them all together, it's an enormous amount, almost 13,000. Most of these are not being used at all. Right? There's an enormous amount that's been collected that's not being used. I also want to emphasize the shape of this. So, so you recognize that there are more features than there are cases. So this is what sometimes people call high dimensional data. So social scientists are, think they're in a world of low dimensional data where they have fewer variables than cases. But actually, that's only because they're using only a small number of the variables that are there. There's actually tons and tons of variables there if we just started to try to use them. OK, so then what we did is we set up a project using the common task method. So the way this works is we picked six outcome variables from age 15. So one, I'll tell you all the outcome variables in a second, but one of them is the GPA of the kid in school, the grades of the kid in school. So for half of the kids, we made the grades available to researchers who participated in the challenge. And then researchers could use this background data and the training data to build a model to try to predict the grades that a kid will get in school based on their background data. Then they would try to predict this holdout data that no one else has access to. And so one feature of this design that I love as a social scientist is that it makes evaluation very easy. So all we have to do is see how well you can predict what is in this held out data, which is very different than a lot of the ways we have to evaluate things. So normally I get papers to review. Like let's say I got a paper about education, and I would have to decide, is this an innovation? Is this a new idea? It's very difficult and time consuming to evaluate. And often that evaluation process is maybe not as fair as it could be. And so one of the great things about making this, about evaluating predictions of held out data, is that everyone can participate. There are no barriers. Like when you participate, you don't need to upload your CV. You don't need to come and give a talk. It's really about how well can you do this task, not how well can you play the academic game. And so one of the things that we saw is that setting up the problem in this way allows lots of new people to come and participate, which is great. As a sociologist, I think like we have a lot of problems research problems. We have a lot of research problems. <laughs> and like our community is not that big. So the more things we can do to bring in other people, the better. To get them to help work on our problems is great. Um, so I think this structure of the common task method, again, it's very common for those of you who are in data science community. It's something we don't do a lot in the social sciences, and I think we should do much, much more. OK, so what were the six outcomes? So two of them were properties of the child, so their GPA in school and their grit. So grit is a psychological measure of something like persistence and perseverance. This was measured through a series of survey questions. Some of the outcomes are properties of the household. So whether the household was evicted from their home and whether the household experienced material hardship. So material hardship is um, kind of like an experienced measure of poverty. Poverty is defined by your income and material hardship is defined by your experiences. So for example, material hardship, include, it's a scale of questions that includes things like, uh, have you ever had your electricity shut off because you couldn't pay the bills? Did you ever go to bed hungry? So those are related to poverty, but they're experiences and not income. Okay, That's household level. And then we also have some that are properties of the parent, the primary caregiver, whether they participated in job training and whether they had job loss. So you see we had six different outcomes that people were trying to predict. Some were about the kid. Some were about the household, some were about the primary caregiver, uh, some were continuous, and some were binary. OK, so we had 457 researchers apply to participate. So I want to be clear that we did not uh, go and post this data on the internet. Um, we, in fact, went through a whole privacy and ethics process about how we would make this data available to, to whom and under what conditions. 
Uh, this is a project that uh, we did with Ian Lundberg, who's a sociology grad student, uh, Karen Levy, who's an information science professor at Cornell, and Arvind, here. And so what we did is we wanted to really think about how we can make this data available to people in a responsible way. This paper describes the procedures that we went through. I'll be happy to talk about that at the end if people are interested. I should also say if you have any questions while we go, feel free to raise your hand and ask. We'll, I'll also leave time at the end, but if you have questions as we go, please ask. Okay. So we had 457 researchers apply to participate. Many of them worked in interdisciplinary teams, and they had one goal, which was to use this massive data set uh, and any method they want, so they can use whatever complicated machine learning they want. They can use any sociological theory they want. Let's say they really, or psychological theory, like maybe they believe the best way to make these predictions is to have great theory, uh, like theory in the social science sense. Great, you could do that. You think a total black box machine learning thing that doesn't even know what the data is would be the best? Great, you could try that too. So everybody tried a bunch of different strategies, and the thing that they were trying to minimize is this mean squared error in the holdout set. So for the cases where people don't know what the answer is, we're going to measure how close they are, their predictions are to the truth. Now, it's often hard to interpret mean squared errors in some absolute sense. So the results I'm going to present to you are going to be in terms of R squared in the holdout set. And so I've defined it like this. Uh, so we're going to have 1 minus. This is the error, the error that you, the total squared error. And then this is the total squared error you would get if you predicted the mean of the training data. So kind of a naive model would be the, the kids in the training data have an average GPA of 2.87. So we'll just predict 2.87 for everyone. And so this measure goes from 0, which would be if you're doing as well as the naive model, basically you're not doing any better than the mean of the training data, to 1 if all of your predictions are perfect. So now, before I show you what happened, I'd like to do a vote. Because I'm, I'm really interested to know what people's expectations are about this. Um, I know what my expectations were. Um, so what I would like you to do is pick one of these six outcomes, like GPA of the kid, and think about how well you think the best model will do, not the average model or the median model, the very best model using any kind of technique possible, how well will we do at predicting that outcome? So how many people think the R squared will be greater than zero? Okay, you have to raise your hand because the R squared is greater than zero. Okay, okay, so no, okay, keep your hand up. How many people think the R squared will be greater than 0.1? I'm gonna keep raising the number and you keep your hand up until you crosses the number. I think this is called a Dutch auction or an English <laughs> auction or something. Okay, so greater than zero, greater than 0.1, greater than 0.2, greater than 0.3, greater than 0.4, greater than 0.5, greater than 0.6, greater than 0.7, greater than 0.8, greater than 0.9. Okay, very good. So. I can tell you, it's very interesting to me when I do this talk in front of sociologists and when I do it in front of data scientists, I get different answers. I would say that data scientists are usually much more optimistic about the power of machine learning. Um, and so I would say a pretty typical result here was about 0.4. Uh, some people were up to 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So now let me show you the results. So here are the R squared values for the six outcomes. So for material hardship and GPA, they were about 0.2. And for the other outcomes, they were pretty close to 0. So now let me show you this on what I think is the right scale, which is this one. So remember, R squared can go from 0 to 1. And so all of the data that, we, that we've collected, all of the theories we have about children and child well-being, that's what's showing up in the blue bar here. And what is happening here in this vast white space. So that is really the dominant pattern. And this is really the big question that we have to figure out now. I should also be clear, this is not what I expected at all. I was totally in the naive camp that, oh, we're just going to do machine learning and it's going to make it all work. And that just did not seem to be the case here. Um, so what is going on with this vast white space? But before I get into that more, I want to show you a couple other features of what we learned from looking at these submissions. Yes? Uh, is this okay time? Yeah, of start? course. Absolutely. So I'm particularly interested in the material hardship mm -hmm. uh, factor in this. 
So this qualitative, uh, not qualitative, but this um, experiential assessment uh, of, that in, ostensibly includes more than just economic status uh, would strike me as le least appropriate for machine learning mm -hmm. because of the like, non-quantifiable uh, aspects mm -hmm. of the factor. Okay. So, what was really interesting to me is that the machine learning actually did the best with the factor that I thought would, it would do the worst at. <laughs> so, um, just by my sociological training, I just figured it would be better at on-off switch type variables. Yes. Binary options as opposed to continuous option uh, op, uh, variables. And I'm interested in, maybe you'll explain this later, but both your thinking, your, hy your hypothesis thinking is to, did, did you have a similar kind of thought and or different, and why, and then why why do you think that the machine learning was actually best with that particular factor as opposed to the other? Sure. So this is definitely, I'm going to come back to this more general question at the end. Um, I think the big question it, to me is like, what kinds of outcomes should, what kinds of level of predictability should we expect for different outcomes for different data? Yeah. That's the most general way of asking the question. And I think we lack any kind of theoretical idea about that. Uh, and so one of the things we want to do is try to build that insight potentially through brute force empiricism, which is just like doing a bunch of these things and trying to see if there are patterns. So why do I think it worked well for material hardship? Um, part of it is that the outcomes that go into this material hardship scale are things that are specific experiences. Um, and they're basically also we're taking an average of 10 things. So the, the, each of those experiences may be difficult to predict individually, but if you want to predict the average, it may be easier. And I think this gets to the question of which kinds of um, outcomes that are potentially scales that combine. Like we know that there's measurement error in lots of social measurements, and so for that reason, we often create scales where we create many measures of the same thing and try to capture an underlying construct. And so material hardship is an example of a theoretical construct that was created by sociologists, uh, Sandy Jenks in particular, and then they made a scale to try to capture that. Also GPA, it turns out, I haven't said exactly how we measured GPA, but it was a series of four questions, four different classes, and so again, you have something like a scale. So it's possible that it has to do with the fact that these are scales. I think another thing, when I was explaining what the outcomes were, I made clear to say that some of these are properties of the kids, some are properties of the household, some are properties of the primary caregiver. I think it's very important that for any one of these outcomes, we can come up with some kind of explanation for why it might not have worked. But it's a pretty consistent pattern across these outcomes that the predictability is low. So let me also now briefly show you some other things that we learned from looking at these predictions. And again, I want to be clear, this is the very best prediction. This is not the average. This is the very best. Yes. Sure. This. Yeah. Do you know what types of uh, machine learning classifiers or models were the best thing to use? Or was it consistent, or was it? Um, I do know that we do know that because um, one of the things that happened during the challenge, people submitted their code, and we're going to open source all the code at the end. Uh, we have done an analysis of the code. We've also had people self-identify the kind of methods they used. We saw pretty much. Anything in scikit-learn was used. Uh, everything, yeah, was used multiple different ways. And I'm going to get back to whether one method or another worked better in about three slides. Okay. So another question that you should ask is, is this even better than doing something very simple? So often, sometimes someone say, I can have a very complicated machine learning model that can predict such and like what the weather is going to be in Los Angeles next year. You can say, well, I can predict what the weather is going to be in Los Angeles next year. It's going to be sunny. Um, so we said, let's try to create a very simple benchmark model. So we picked four variables that most social scientists would be considered to be the kind of four most important, four, four things that would likely go into any model. And then we just use linear regression or logistic regression. And so here are the results using this is the best possible machine learning that any of these people could do. And here's what we get from a four variable linear regression model. So you see complicated machine learning plus thousands of other variables gives you some increase in performance. But I would say it's not really a qualitative difference. Um, and so I think keeping in mind that 
This is an incremental improvement over a four variable regression model is appropriate when we interpret the results from these complicated machine learning methods. Now, I mean, there's two ways to look at this. One is kind of disappointing, um, but the other is kind of optimistic, which is like, hey, we can just using four variables and linear regression, we can do pretty close to state of the art. So I like to think of it also in that kind of positive way. Um, so let me try to show you a little bit more about what these mean, because I think a lot of people are squares. It's not a measure that everyone is used to. So we're going to use my favorite visualization device, which is a scatter plot. So this is for material hardship. This is the best submission that we received during the challenge. So this is the prediction that people made, and this is the truth. And so if the predictions were perfect, they would all fall along this 45 degree line. But what you see, this dotted line, what this is, is the mean of the training data. So the best way to understand what these predictions are is they're basically predicting the mean of the training data. And for people whose true material hardship is very high, you're, some, you're generally predicting more than the mean of the training data. And for people whose material hardship is very low, you're generally predicting a little bit less than the mean of the training data. But if your idea is that the machine learning is getting the truth with a little bit of noise, that's wrong. What it really is, is getting the mean of the training data with a little bit of signal, right? So that's what we see in the best submission, and this is the benchmark for variable model. So these are, to me, to my eye, look quite similar. So again, there's two main patterns here. One is they're basically just predicting the mean of the training data with a slight signal, and second, there's not a huge distinction between the best submission and the benchmark. Yep. How big was the training set versus the holdout? Yeah, so the training set, uh, there was 2,100 cases in the training set. But then there was about three, uh, only about a quarter of the cases were missing outcome data. Because some of the people drop out of the study. It's hard to stay in touch with all these people for so many years. And so roughly there are about 1,500 cases uh, where there's outcome data available. And then the holdout set is roughly three eighths available. So it would be about 1,500. Okay? Arvind. Are there other measures that we know from previous research are, uh, are, are there other outcomes that we know are substantially more predictable than this? So it's often the case that people, so, there, uh, so I would say the answer is no. We, there are no other outcomes that we necessarily know are more predictable. I think there are other outcomes that people often study, um, and it is true that people have done analysis to try to predict income, um, but often they try to predict like average income over a long period of time. So I think social scientists have done things to try to make the results more predictable than they are, or not, which is, I think, a lot different than in a policy setting where you want to predict what's going to happen to someone next year. A lot of our social science theories and ideas are really about what's going to happen to someone over their whole lifetime, which is really potentially averaging over many years, averaging over many different kinds of outcomes. OK, so again, this, this shows the best submission is actually very similar to just predicting the mean of the training data. And it's not qualitatively different than the four variable linear regression. This, yeah? Oh, how well they did on predicting the, the train, how well they predicted their own training data. Yeah, yeah so this is a, another interesting question. So let me, expl let me try to rephrase this. So one question is, given the data that you have, how well can you build a model to predict that data? And this is sometimes called in-sample predictability. And then a second question is, how well can you use that model to predict data that the model has never seen? And so. This is an important distinction because almost all social science measures of predictability are in-sample measures, which makes them even more surprisingly bad. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we have, I, didn't, I don't have it here, but we have it in, in one of the papers. We have a scatter plot where we show the R squared for the holdout data and the R squared for the training data. And what you see is like some people get R squared of like all the way up to one in the training data. And then when you open the holdout data, it doesn't have that same performance. So I think this is a very important lesson for social scientists, which is as we start using these more flexible models, the ability to get our in-sample R squared up to really, really high, it, it's, it's much easier. 
Um, but that's not really giving us a measure of what we want, and that's why increasingly I think we need to move to these settings where we have specifically held out data. So this result qualitatively holds for both GPA and GRIT, the other continuous outcomes. So again, for both you see the best submission is basically predicting the mean of the training data, and the best submission and the benchmark are quite similar. So now I want to give you some more plots to try to show you what it looks like for the continuous outcomes like eviction. So here is the best submission for eviction. This is the distribution of predicted probabilities of eviction for the people that were evicted. This is the distribution of predicted probabilities for the people that were not evicted. So if these models were working really well, you would see this all the way over here and this all the way over here. You see very little separation. Again, the dotted line is the mean of the training data. So again, we see qualitatively, basically the best submission is predicting the mean of the training data with a little bit of signal, like this is a little bit shifted this way, this is a little bit shifted that way. And qualitatively, this is very similar to the benchmark data. And again, we see this for all three of the binary outcomes. So, so far I've been focused on the best submission, but one of the great things about doing a mass collaboration is that we see 160 teams in this case take different approaches to trying to solve this problem. And we can see how similar these results are and how different they are. And so what I'm going to show you next is I'm going to show you the pattern in the prediction error. So one of the questions that was asked is like, are there some methods that are better than other methods? Um, so what I want to show you is for each team, I want to show you the prediction error for each kid. Okay, so I'm going to make, it's going to be like a big heat map, and the redder it is, the bigger the squared error. And so here's what it is for material hardship. So this is each of the teams, this is each of the kids, or the families, and so this is, for example, the prediction error for this particular family, for this particular team. You see mostly white here. That's because most of the models predict most of the families really well. And you see there's a small number of families that are poorly predicted by all of the models. So if your idea is like, oh, some models are going to be better at predicting big families and some are going to be better at predicting small families, then maybe we could do some kind of fancy machine learning to combine them and then we get a better prediction. That's not what's happening. Basically, the variation in the models is very small. Basically, these are sorted. Sorry, let me. These are sorted. These are the people that are hardest to predict. This is the best model. So you see very little change as you go from the best model to the worst model. But you see a huge difference as you move from the people that are hardest to predict to the people that are easiest to predict. Yeah? So, how many units are on the y axis? This makes it look like actually you did really well. Most of these sort of white and so most of them have a low so so this is gets to be a question of what you think is the right error metric so if you think MSE is the right error metric and you think R squared is the right error metric that's what it is but this shows that a lot of the error metric is being driven by a relatively small number of people who are very poorly predicted so then you may wonder who are these people um, that's what we wondered too. Um, and I'll come back to them later. But what the best we can tell from the data we have is that these are people that just have unusual outcomes. So these are kids who have very low levels of material hardship. Extremely, these are basically people that have very high levels of material hardship. Because remember, the models are all predicting basically the mean of the training data. So someone who has a very deviant outcome has a big error. So we see this pattern, again, shows up for all six outcomes. And it's much more clear in the binary outcomes what's happening. So basically, all the models are predicting the mean of the training data. So if you're evicted, you have big error. If you're not evicted, you have a small error. Yep? What happens to your analysis when you exclude them as outliers? Well, they're really people who got evicted. Well, but, they're, <laughs> you know, but they're of not. Of course, but I think this is part of the point of the project is that social science researchers would look at something like this and say, just outliers, and now my R squared is going to go up if I exclude them. But I think part of what you're, which is yeah. yes, and but that's part of the problem that you're highlighting as well, because you can't just exclude them. You're trying to find a way to uh, actually accommodate and actually pr better predict them. So I guess what I'm asking though is if you did take them out as outliers, does the mod does the four does the four yeah. variable model become amazing and does the does the original does the best 
um, does the best machine learning model become amazing as well? Because that that tells you that can teach you about what uh, what steps may or may not social science tools can or machine learning can take. Sure. So I think we're committed the whole time. We told people that the goal was we set the goal at the beginning to minimize mean squared error, and so we're committed to sticking with that goal. But in subsequent research, we're actually very interested in changing what the error metric is. And for other policy situations, there may be other error metrics that may be more important. And I'll come back to that when I talk a little bit more about the next steps. So basically, everything. Jonathan? Quick question on uh, what folks tried. Yeah. Um, did any of the teams invest a uh, serious effort in like, rebalancing the classes or otherwise trying to account for these sorts of costs? Yes. Okay. They did that. They invested. I, did you, I think Malta might have even done that. Uh, so best, yes, the, the answer is yes, some people did that. Um, so I want to now talk a little bit about what I think this means. So basically everything that I've said before, it just happened. So we might disagree about what it means, but it did happen. So we, I think what it means is a little bit less clear. So I want to like mark a division between now we're into more speculation. Um, so I think one question is, is this a fundamental limit for predictive performance for this particular data and this particular prediction task? So maybe there's some other machine learning method that you could use that would do better. I personally am skeptical. We had 160 teams try, but obviously if someone could do better, that's great. So one of the other great things about the common task method is that it sets a clear benchmark, and which ex it encourages more people to participate. So if someone out there has a new method that can do better, great. I would love for someone to do better, and if someone can do better, I would be delighted to read their paper, right? This is a great way for us to benchmark how we're doing and how we can make progress. Question that I'm personally a little bit more interested in is why is the unpredictability so high? Even when we're using modern machine learning methods and what many social scientists would consider to be a large high quality data set, many computer scientists might not consider this to be a large data set. Uh, but as social scientists, I think many of us would have considered this to be large. Um, so there are a number of possible explanations. Some are related to measurement error and the outcomes. We heard an example of that. There could be important unmeasured features. So like maybe there's some characteristics of these kids that haven't been measured that should be measured. Or maybe there are some social processes in the world that are driving this unpredictability that we're not thinking about. So an example would be in certain domains, we have models and theories that lead us to expect unpredictability. So I think the efficient market hypothesis is one where we expect unpredictability even in the presence of enormous amounts of data and very complicated techniques. Um, also the weather, we have kind of physical models which lead us to suspect that long-term accurate weather forecasts have some kind of fundamental limit. So maybe there are social processes that are driving this randomness. So how are we going to figure out if these things exist? So what we're going to do is we're not going to do a machine learning technique. Uh, we are going to do a social science technique, which is actually go and talk to these people. So we are going to do in-depth, and we have done, in-depth interviews with a number of these families. But we're going to use the machine learning to help us find the people that are most important to interview. So like what this result sort of looks like to me is there are these big forces out there acting on these people's lives that we don't know what they are. So we're kind of calling these things dark matter. And so <laughs> if you want to go and find the dark matter, how do you do it? So the normal way a sociologist would decide who to interview is often it's kind of ad hoc. And if they were trying to be very formal and precise, they might do a random sample. But if you want to discover the dark matter, a random sample is not necessarily the most efficient thing. You want to talk to the people that have the most of the dark matter. And so what we're doing is we're using the predictions of the first stage to help us find the people that are most likely to have this dark matter. So we're interviewing kids who are doing much better than expected. We're interviewing kids that are doing much worse than expected. And we're also interviewing kids who are doing as expected because we also don't want to fool ourselves uh, because there are certain... Uh, we need to you interview the kids who are doing as expected to get a kind of baseline for what are the lives of these kids like. Um, so this is a figure describing our sampling process, but basically it's what I just told you. In three cities, 
We're interviewing kids who are doing particularly well, particularly poorly, and as expected, we're interviewing the kid and the primary caregiver. And what we hope is that this will set up this kind of cycle of continuous improvement. So we do systematic longitudinal data collection, then we have predictive modeling, then we do these interviews. That helps us improve our data collection, and we can do this 100 times, and then eventually we might get better at it. Um, so what's next for this project? <clears throat> so we have one community paper where everyone who made a, a contribution to the challenge that beat the mean of the training data is a co-author. That paper is currently under review. Uh, when that paper is published, we'll open source all the predictions that people submitted and all the code that they generated. And we hope this will be a new kind of set of data for future research, for people who want to know what kinds of techniques work best, for what kinds of people. Uh, we also have a special issue of the journal Socius, which is a new open access journal from the American Sociological Association. Anyone who participated in the challenge had a chance to submit an article describing their approach that would go through peer review. Um, and I think critically, these were reviewed independent of the predictive performance. So we talked to a bunch of journals and they're like, oh, we'll publish only the most accurate ones. And we're like, no, you have to publish all of them because like, that's important to see that like, the variability in techniques. And if someone tries something and it doesn't work well, that's actually really important to know also. So these are evaluated independent of predictive performance. Uh, they did go through a peer review process. We have 12 of them uh, uh, with the accompanying code. It's very interesting to read all the different approaches that people took. Uh, we have also three papers from our own research group describing some of the techniques and methods we had to develop to run the challenge. So the first is the privacy and ethics paper that I mentioned earlier uh, that Arvind is a co-author on. We also have a paper about improved metadata for the survey. This sounds like a very boring thing, but I want to explain why I think this is an overlooked barrier to progress. So this data had been used by hundreds of researchers, but all of the documentation, the, the metadata, the data about the data, was designed for humans to read and not designed for machines to read. And so what happened is when you want to use all 12,000 of the variables, it becomes basically impossible to do without enormous amounts of human effort. And so what we did is we saw the approaches that people did during the challenge. Many of them open sourced what they did. There's, including a graduate student here, Greg Gunderson, built like an API that allowed people to query and to get some access to information about the metadata. And this was like a, something we had never even thought of doing. And it was great. And so we took all the, the metadata products that people built, they gave them to us, we improved them, and then made them available to the entire Fragile Families research community. So this is a paper about that process. This last pro paper is uh, with David Liu, who was an undergrad here, and his senior thesis was about ensuring computational reproducibility for all of the papers in the special issue. So basically, can you take the code and the data and produce the same output? Seems very easy. Turns out to be not that easy. This paper describes some of the challenges that we had, advice to future authors and future journals about how to do this better. Um, so I think one big question going forward uh, is how typical is this result? So we picked like one set of outcomes for one particular data set with one particular error metric. And there's all these questions about, could it be different if you do it some other way? And I think that's the thing that we have to figure out. So what if we picked different outcomes in the fragile families data, a different error metric? What if we did different things with the privacy and ethics audit? So for example, we did not release any geographic information. We tried to strip out all the geographic information because geographic information would be helpful for a re-identification attack. Geographic information also might be helpful for prediction. So you know, we could have made different decisions and that might have led to different results. Also, there are a number of specific things about the fragile family study that may be different than other longitudinal studies. Here's a long list. Um, so I think more mass collaborations with longitudinal surveys are the way to go. Um, there are dozens of longitudinal studies happening all over the world, pretty much in every OECD country. They vary a lot, uh, but some start when a kid is born, like the fragile families. Some start when a kid enters school. Some start when someone enters the labor force. Some start when people retire. Um, this data is all collected under informed consent, under well-developed ethical procedures, unlike certain kinds of administrative data. 
Uh, there's already a strong research community around each of these surveys. These collaborations yield a credible estimate of the best possible predictive performance. I want to emphasize this. So if we had just done this in-house and produced these results, you might say, oh, well, Matt doesn't know about random forests or deep learning or whatever. But the fact that 160 teams tried and this is the best, it adds a lot to the credibility of this estimate. So something about the collaboration that provides credibility for an estimate that no, can be provided by no single research team. Uh, also, the code from any single challenge can be reproduced, repurposed to make many simulated challenges. So we have a full population of the approaches that people used in the challenge, and we can then like try those same approaches to predict a bunch of the other outcomes from age 15. Or we could try those approaches to using data just from birth to year five to try to predict year nine. And so within any challenge, there are pieces that you can then generalize and repurpose to do many, many, many simulated challenges. Uh, there are a number of open questions about how to do that, uh, and that's one of the things that we're going to be working on. So again, this project was motivated by Wikipedia, and it's something about what we can all do together uh, that none of us can do individually. And I think we came up with this surprising finding, and I think the next steps are going to also have to involve lots of people working together. And again, this is an example of the kind of thing that we can do when we combine ideas from social science and data science. So thank you. OK, so we have about five minutes for questions. And then we'll stop. And then I'll hang out. And people can stay and ask more questions also if they'd like. Yes? Well, it seems like you need to discover some dark energy. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we did have a Republican official some years ago that talked about the known unknowns and unknown yes. unknowns. Uh, I'm not sure that applies here, but there's something about that that resonates. Yes, absolutely. So I think the unknown unknowns are what we really hope to discover as we go out and do these interviews. Um, and I can say that for me, I've done a few of the interviews myself, and it's been really, really good for it sounds super naive, but that's like realizing about the complexity of the world, right? Like you can sit here in your office at Princeton and think about something for a long time, and it's just hard to realize everything that's out there. And so I think this combination of predictive modeling with interviews is a really good way to stimulate new ideas for researchers about new theories they should have new kinds of data to collect. Otherwise, it's very hard to find the unknown unknowns. If you're just sitting in your office, it's going to be hard to find them. Yeah, Pranay? So was there a sense of competition among these teams? Uh, so I don't know if there's a prize. So. Yes. So the, the question was about competition. So we, tr we explicitly labeled this as a mass collaboration, not as a competition. Uh, we encouraged people to, for example, open source their work as they went. Um, and we tried to build a community. Um, there were prizes, but they were not monetary prizes. So some of these contests in machine learning and data science, they have monetary prizes. We didn't think that was appropriate for a scientific project. So we had prizes that were, the main, the main prize was a trip to Princeton University <laughs> to present your research. Um, so this is a prize that was very attractive to the kinds of people we wanted to attract. And it was also not attractive to the kinds of people we did not want to attract. <laughs> um, I will also say another big uh, motivation for people that we, th we w thought was really important was the ability to publish papers. So we did a survey of people when they uh, applied to get data access. And this is something people seemed interested in. And anecdotally, when we talked to people, for the people that took it the most seriously, the chance to publish their work was a, an exciting thing, both to publish collectively now, the collectively, it's hard because each person can't really write about their approach in detail. And so we have this special issue where people can write about their approach in detail. So we think that you know, science has models for rewarding people for effort that contributes to scientific progress. Publication is a big one. And so we want to try to make use of those institutions that already exist in science to help encourage people to participate. OK? And then. I was um, fascinated by the collaboration aspect. Mm -hmm. And the question I have is, with Wikipedia, I think a lot of the work gets done by a very small number of people. And I was wondering if you had a similar dynamic where the best models were very few, but they were the most helpful by a large amount. 
And, and I wonder because it's so compelling when you say this was the best of 162, but was really, it's sort of the best of like 10 or five that did most of the work. Yeah. So um, I, there was there was huge very not huge there was some variation in the amount of time that teams worked on the project and the number of people in the teams, um, but one of the things that we saw is that working more wasn't necessarily helpful. So sometimes people who did very simple things actually did better than some people that tried to do very complicated things that took a long time. But I think that you're right in that 160 is kind of a weird number because. I haven't that those are the teams that beat the bench the mean of the training data on one of the outcomes. But if we had said spent more than let's say forty hours working on it, it's not clear how many that is. So one of the challenges is that we do not have a ton of information about how exactly people were doing this, because they were working kind of on their own. One of the things we thought about is trying to get them to work on a hosted platform because then we would have full visibility into every single thing that they tried and did, and we could measure who's doing what and how long. Uh, but then it, we didn't think that we could actually host that platform effectively. Um, and we thought that even a professional high quality hosted platform would create some barriers to entry, which we didn't really want to create. So I think there is a trade-off um, in future challenges between <clears throat> kind of how much instrumentation you want and how much, uh, how many barriers to entry you're willing to create, and we kind of erred on the side of allowing people to participate. But I could imagine in the future you would do it a little bit differently. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, could you reverse engineer any policy um, prescriptions from from some of these models? Sure. So I think one of the biggest policy prescriptions, so this is a great question, is like, what are the implications of this for policymakers? So I think one, the most important is have realistic expectations about what machine learning can do. I think a lot of the examples that we've seen so far have been chosen, now again, we're in the speculation land, have been chosen by machine learning researchers because they are situations where machine learning is likely to be successful. Because researchers generally want to make themselves look good. That's like one of the things that we know about researchers. So in this case, we did not pick this problem because we thought it would be effective. We picked it completely because of data availability. So I, need, I had this idea that I wanted to do this, and I needed someone who was had access to one of these longitudinal studies who was excited about doing this also. So that's how I ended up working with the Fragile Families data set. It's not that Sarah and I thought the Fragile Families data set was particularly good or particularly bad for this particular task. So I think I would say that we did like kind of a random-ish sample of the space of all possible predictions, and this is the result we get. And a lot of other people are doing purposive sampling of the space of all possible predictions, and they get different results. And so one next thing to do is try to expand this, get some more measurements in this space. Um, also, I think another important thing is that complex models don't always work better than simple models. This is something people in machine learning already know. But we found that more than half of the models did worse than the simple benchmark model. So it's not always clear to me that in a realistic situation, it's worth all the effort to have this complex model over the simple model. So I think, but and, and then the importance of needing to pr check your predictions on held out data. So. These are all things that machine learning researchers already know, but we hope that these results communicate them in a way that policymakers, it will be easier for them to understand. So now we are out of time, so I want to thank you all for coming, and I'll be happy to stay and chat if people have more questions.